Hello, I'm here with Jay and Justin of the Library Punks, and they will be talking to me about the fiasco and shenanigans that has been the Internet Archive and its effects on, well, media altogether as a whole, but also libraries and other things. Um, I'm going to let Jay and Justin introduce themselves in a second, but I've been listening to their show for a little while because, in addition to being a left media person myself, I am a high school teacher and thus deal with library bullshit constantly. Um, so <laughs> it's like the bane of my existence. I live in Utah. You can see how that goes for me. Um, yeah, I used to live in Utah too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about how you got into the controversies of the archive of the internet. <laughs> Go ahead, Jay. Okay, um, so my name is Jay, I use he, him pronouns, um, and I am a cataloging librarian in Boston. Yeah. I'm Justin, I'm a Scarlet Communications librarian, I use he, they pronouns. Um, Scarlet Communications deals with publishing, uh, open science, open data, um, open access, and so that's one of the ways that uh, Internet Archive came into my life is um, it's more or less directly related to the work I do. So uh, I've talked to several people who are like department heads at Internet Archive as a course of just like doing my work, uh, come into contact with them every once in a while, simply because they do a lot of cutting edge stuff. And uh, I've done a lot of um, like uh, professional development around copyright, um, including with um, one of the major sort of figures in like the defense for the internet archive, Kyle Courtney. Um, he does a lot of uh, education for librarians around fair use and copyright. Um, so I've taken like several workshops and classes with him. So one of the things that I have gathered from listening to your podcast prior discussions of the internet archive and whatever I can find about these court cases, it seems like this is a scenario where even the good guys aren't actually doing that good of things. Um, yeah. Whoever the, whoever the good guys are. Um, so, yeah, let, let's get to the specific case. How bad has this case around the Internet Archive hurt library and archival materials and why? Let's start there. Not much. Not a whole lot yet. Um, the Internet Archive is catastrophizing on purpose. <laughs> that's true. It's, yeah. The Internet Archive is not going to go away. Um, my concern has always been that this will impact other libraries who want to do controlled digital lending and will look at this case and say, well, that's too much of a risk for us to take on now. Uh, so we're not going to even invest. And in, you know, people like me who want to do controlled digital lending where we aren't already doing it. I have to go to my supervisor and say, I want to do this. And they say, well, didn't that lawsuit just happen? And it doesn't. Kyle Courtney, who Jay just mentioned, has a great write up. I'll send you the link to it so people can read it. Um, has a great write up saying, look, this only affects the Second Circuit. Um, this only affects like new books that are that have licensing options. So you could make your controlled digital lending focused around books that aren't going to get ebook versions and that would you know not touch on what this case did but this case was kind of so aggressive in saying control digital lending is not a thing it's kind of hard to to imagine that another circuit court wouldn't say the exact same thing so again right now it hasn't like shut down anyone's controlled digital lending but as always i've been worried that in the practical actual day-to-day -day things people are very risk averse and you know, if I go to my supervisor and say, I want to do this, he's going to say, well, the, the, didn't that lawsuit happen? And that's another, that's why I personally was very annoyed about this lawsuit because it affects my ability to do my job. <laughs> um, so why is the Internet Archive catastrophizing and why do you think so many people haven't given to repeating their version of the story? Um, 
we don't have very kind things to say about Brewster Kale <laughs> and um, it's him mainly kind of going on an ego trip. Um, and like, we're the last bastion of li libraries being able to do this. And like, I think through the internet archives messaging, like, I feel like everyone I see on Twitter thinks that the internet archive in general is going to go away um, because of the way that the internet archive is talking about this case. Um, and so I think it's just like get people on their side. Um, but also it's just Brewster Kale and his ego who, uh, Brewster Kale is the founder of the internet archive. Yeah. And I think other department heads, um, like the head of the open library, who's uh Chris Freeland, um, also, you know, have that tendency to talk up, you know, we're, we're, we're David, we're taking on Goliath. The publishers are coming after us. This is totally unfair. When really it was a, it was a situation they got themselves into by doing a highly publicized and really we're coming to the rescue of, um, of the emergency um, lending National library emergency that they library. did national yeah. emergency library, which was kind of what got all the attention and, got them enough to attention to get sued, which is kind of not what you want to do. So what was the ground of the lawsuit? I remember when I first read about this, um, I was sort of shocked that they were surprised that they got sued. So I want to go into this uh, legal detail a little bit because I was like, how did you think you weren't going to get sued for that? But go ahead. Well, there's always a certain amount of legal risk when you're doing something like controlled digital lending. So even if they hadn't made a big deal of the National Emergency Library, which was controlled digital lending, the way it works is you uh, use you combine a couple sections of the Copyright Act and take physical books that you own put them out of circulation, digitize them, and then you only loan as many digital copies as physical copies you have. So those all go into a warehouse or a back room. They don't circulate. And then you have controlled lending of only that many copies at a time. So they have to have uh, like digital rights management on it, DRM, so that they can't be copied. So they lend it out, they expire. So the same way that checking out works in general um, when you have limited copies and limited access. So what the National Emergency Library did was take off those limits of the loan to own ratio. And that doesn't gel with the whole theory behind controlled digital lending, which was one of the reasons I was annoyed that this whole case was about controlled digital lending when it it was and wasn't. Like the the publishers did challenge the very idea of controlled digital lending and said, well, this is not written into the Copyright Act explicitly so it doesn't exist but that's also been true of a lot of things that libraries have done over the years uh like interlibrary loan i know one of the arguments for the national emergency library specifically was that um because it was um because so many libraries had closed this was early in the pandemic they argued that this was um like a transformative or emergency like use um because like like I, I remember they said like a lot of their use cases was like schools being like we need like 15 copies of catcher in the rye and our library is closed so we can't read catcher in the rye and then our archive was like aha here you know everyone can have catcher in the rye now or whatever um and so they were arguing that it was transformative because of the nature of the situation um which is a stretch um, like, I want to come out and say that, like, I think the, the concept of, um, like the loan to own ratio for digital stuff is bullshit, right? Like we should not have digital scarcity. Um, and that is something that publishers and copyright law enforce on us. So like, in theory, I like what the internet archive did and I was defending them as they were doing it. Um, but then other stuff comes out about like, they weren't, um, they were being kind of sloppy with how they were not even just doing the national emergency library, but the rest of their control digital lending on the open library. So the original lawsuit was, mm -hmm. um, in 2020, um, hatchet 
which I know it's not how it's pronounced, but I just like pronouncing it that way. Hatchet Is it not pronounced Hatchet? Collins. I think it's a shit. Well, that's um, <laughs> Harper Collins, John Wiley, and Penguin Random House sued in an archive claiming copyright infringement for 127 books, for which there was an existing ebook market. So these are books that you can license an ebook. You can't buy an ebook because it's a digital copy. You you never own anything that you buy in a digital version. Uh, you only ever license it, which is kind of the root of the problem. Is there's no digital first sale doctrine. You can't own a thing. Um, so they argued it was basic copyright infringement and, and Internet Archive defended itself with Section 107 saying this is fair use. And mm -hmm. it's fair use through the mechanism of controlled digital lending, which means that we've taken a couple of the rights that libraries have. And in the way that, like, I think the easiest way to explain it is the way VCRs were allowed to work because it was time shifting. You could think of this as format shifting. Uh, the work isn't changed. It's not transformed. Uh, it's the exact same work. It's just no longer a print version. It's now a scanned print version. It's not even really a digital version. You can't even really highlight or modify the text you would if you had bought like an ebook. Um, although with the, the state of ebook readers these days, you can't really get much extra value out of that anyway, which maybe is what the publishers are a little worried about. But in theory, if you bought an ebook version, it's more accessible. The lines are cleaner. It's, it's not a scan. So this is literally just format shifting from print to digital and everything else kind of is supposed to stay the same. Uh, so that was the argument and the, the argument relied on fair use, um, basically saying that since all these other public libraries and school libraries are closed, we are loaning on behalf of those copies mm -hmm. that can't circulate. So, yeah, um, I I think people kind of have finally gotten the feel that we don't own anything digital. <laughs> that it's all it's all basically a rent market on rights. There's no for sales ownership rights, um, which is kind of a disaster even for capitalist ownership rights uh, it, because basically. People think they own something and they don't. Um, and we've seen this concept expand to things like the Internet of Things, a.k.a. now you have to have a subscription to drive your car, um, which is... Or even worse, uh, sorry to jump in, but even yeah. worse, like accessibility things. You remember all those stories of people who uh, were completely blind uh, having uh, visual implants, well, that stuff runs on software, and those people are no. The, the company went out of business, and those people no longer can see even after having these very expensive um, prosthetics made. So it's um, it's even worse than sort of con just regular consumer goods, but also medical goods, which is really scary. Yeah. Mm. It is interesting that archaic laws and book and book publishing actually were the vanguard here, because um, usually, if those of you who follow anything about publishing copyrights, usually it's like the rear guard of everything. We're still governed by like World War II level laws, um, but it's not in this case. Um, so I get why people would want to be sympathetic to the Internet Archive on this. Like I, I also, when I first heard about it, it's like, oh, of course I, I side with them. But there is some stuff about how they were justifying their original scans, who owned the copies, how are they making money off that. That stuff got a lot more questionable. We haven't gone into that very much, but um, where are the original scans? Who owns them and who got paid for the scanning? Uh, so the scans are hosted on the Internet Archive servers, and they do the digitizing. So they, yeah. uh, they have their own scanners. They have their own warehouses of books. Uh, so they usually get them through donation or purchase. And then those stay in a warehouse and they don't circulate and they only circulate through the open library. Yeah, their their argument is that they're trying to sort of do the digital first sale. Like, oh, well, we, oh, we bought the book or the book was donated to us by usually libraries. Um, libraries donate a lot of these. Um, and so they're like, we own this book, we have it, so we can make 
this scan and provide this access. Um, like that's sort of the argument. And like in the United States, this is different in Canada and the UK. Like authors don't make anything off of circulation in a library. They make money theoretically, like when the library buys the book through publishers or royalties or whatever. And ebook licenses are uh, a nightmare, um, especially for public libraries. Um, but as far as the actual circulation, like authors don't make money off of that in the United States, in the UK and in Canada, they do. Um, but the argument that authors were losing money off of this was also, um, kind of factually incorrect as well. Yeah. The, the, the case, particularly what it came down to is because they were doing controlled digital lending with books that you could buy as an ebook, mm -hmm. this was replacing that ebook market. So, unfortunately, in a case like this, when you're the defendant, uh, the burden of proof falls on you to prove that you did no uh, market harm. And that's impossible for you to prove because all of the market data lies with the people suing you and there's no discovery for that so that there's no way you can find out if their sales were actually impacted. So part of the, the possible upsides from this case, not an upside, but the way you could continue doing controlled digital lending is focus on books that are not available commercially as eBooks and that probably never will be. Um, so rare books, local books, um, books that while still in copyright because that's if it's in the public domain it's no longer a problem so this is all about books and copyright uh but if you have like local books say a book was published in the 70s and it's about local history that book's not getting a reprint most likely and every library has local collections like every academic library at least is going to have local collections full of books like that which are stuck in copyright for another 50 60 70 years and we can't do anything with them except hold on to the physical versions. That's a little ridiculous. Um, why can't we do controlled digital lending with those unique materials? Hmm. There is a lot of that. I think people underestimate the the amount of material that is not available on ebook that is also still not in the public domain. It's it's there's a ton. Um, do we want to speak to that at all? Like, Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say there's also like a, a, a very large class of ebooks that although they are available to consumers, um, they are not available to libraries because like a library just can't go on Amazon and buy a Kindle ebook. For example, like we have to do it through certain vendors or publishers, like there's specific licenses that go along with them. And so like all of the, you know, the, the great sort of self-published romance novels and stuff that are on Kindle Unlimited, libraries can't have any of those because libraries can't have access to Kindle Unlimited. For example, the Internet Archive and Controlled Digital, digital Lending shouldn't like start, like that wouldn't be a, a place to infringe upon without getting, you know, caught. But like, that's also like an area that libraries can't um access as, as well like not every ebook even is available to libraries yeah and that's a another problem because yeah, we can't even get a physical version yeah oh yeah well yeah there's a lot of these books that, that are also only ebooks correct i wasn't even thinking about that i i yeah. know for people who don't know the owner the onerousness of licensing ebooks for libraries and public uh schools and whatnot is a lot worse than people realize and a lot it, it actually dramatically increases the yes. the cost of books so for example um if you thought we had a textbook problem before when we were using physical textbooks for those of us in public schools we basically don't have textbooks anymore and have trouble licensing them because they're ungodly expensive per student per year um, do y'all spend like a car every year for them? Like, cause that's an academic yeah. library. It's like, sometimes it's a car or more worth of money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, just like often it's like $15 a year, a license per student. So only one mm -hmm. student can have it. So we're going to have to buy like, I don't know, a thousand of them. And yep. they're more expensive just for the yearly rent than buying a physical copy of the book. Yep. Um, and so 
for a lot of people who thought we were going to be able to get out of textbook problems by by digital learning laws, we've actually learned we've learned about the copyright law that actually no, we don't just not get out of textbook problems. We actually have more problems financing it than we did before. And in, in that sense, I think people have like I got asked recently, like, why don't kids read novels anymore? And I was literally like, it's hard for us to get the rights to actually use them. This is not a physical copy and we're not buying new physical copies because a lot of people got on tech bandwagons. However, we don't have the money to license them either. So we kind of, if it's not in the public domain, you know, uh, so you're going to get a lot of Shakespeare and Great Gatsby because that's where we can go. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and I mean, I think this has a knock-on effect. To bring it back to the to the Internet Archive, though, um, why do you think so many people have mistaken this with the whole memory hole problem of the Internet? I mean, we, we know that there's a memory hole problem in the Internet. Internet Archive doesn't get everything. Uh, neither does the Wayback Machine, et cetera. But um, this seems to have tripped on anxieties which people legitimately have for which this case speaks not at all to. Like, what do you think is going on there? The Internet Archive said it. <laughs> like I've seen tweets of theirs. Like they're they're not being um, they're like they're catastrophizing. That's one of the reasons. But also, people don't realize all of the different functions of the Internet Archive. Like a lot of people don't realize they have the book lending thing. They just think about like the Wayback Machine, right? Because hi Arthur. Um, a lot of times when I see people like being like, oh, we're going to lose all of these backed up websites. Like, and that's all they know about the internet archive as like the archive of the internet. Um, so I, I think people just not realizing all of the different things that the internet archive does, um, is part of what's causing this. Yeah. And when you talk about memory hole, I, I think there's another aspect where, because of the way that platforms live and die, um, people experience digital death multiple times. Where they lose everything with an account. So, you know, oh, I lost all my memories in MySpace. Oh, I lost all my memories on Facebook. I lost all my memories on my Twitter account when I got banned. Or I lost all my videos I made on YouTube. And so there is a, a large amount of anxiety out there about, like, realizing for the first time that, who's preserving this? And the answer is kind of no one. Um, some people are, and some stuff gets preserved, but not all of it. And people start to think like, how does information get into an archive? How do, how do I get remembered? You know, I've seen a lot of people have these, these existential crises on Twitter. Um, for example, when they're like, well, what happens when Twitter dies? Where does all this stuff go? All this, you know, reporting uh, that happened or all of this. So there's a lot of like existential anxiety about digital preservation that I think hits people at different times when there's a lot of instability. And I think the fear of losing the Internet Archive is one of those moments of instability where it triggers that reaction in people. Right. Like, uh, remember when like the in Russian invasion of Ukraine happened, there was a lot of librarians who got together um, and like um, got volunteers just from the Internet to do a bunch of web scraping and archiving for Ukrainian cultural heritage sites. But no such effort, uh, some effort, but not nearly to the extent has happened uh, for Palestine, uh, for example, like this sort of memory hole thing is very selective. All right. It plays on pre-existing anxieties mm -hmm. and um, it it hits people at different times. I think particularly you'll see it. I saw, I think I saw a lot of it in 2020 in particular um, when you had like um, a research, like, like a, I don't know, it's the word resurgence, groundswell of support, like popular support for Black Lives Matter. And then I saw quite a few black people on Twitter have these moments where they go, how does this get preserved? How does our, how do our memories get made? How do we get into these archives? And the, the fear of like having to interact with that type of bureaucracy and like, Oh, maybe we need to make community archives. Maybe we need to be printing stuff out. Maybe we need to uh, start building libraries and, and syllabi and stuff to, 
keep this somewhere so someone will remember what happened and, and what we did and all the work we were putting into it. So it can it can that anxiety triggers in different communities at different times. I'm sure there's a lot of Palestinian academics yeah. out there who are having that exact same crisis and going, we've got to save everything we can. Yeah. There's just not been like the public outcry about it from like yeah. non-Palestinians like there was for like Ukraine, for example. Yeah. I know like libraries and archivists of Palestine has been doing stuff and there, there's been folks doing things, but yeah. And like the videos that get captured and put on Twitter. I know there mm -hmm. are people out there archiving them just on their own. Yeah. yeah. This brings me to something that uh, will seem a little bit off or further afield, but I do want to talk a little bit about, which is the ephemerality of digital media, not just the internet, digital media in general, because yeah. people seem to not understand data decay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Bit rot, uh, baby. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, even in my own life, I have been carrying around files that I thought were still valid that I went to open up that were like 20 years old because I've always used Word docs or whatever. I've been going, oh, this no longer opens. Like, yeah. I have a printed copy somewhere, but like, <laughs> uh, I haven't thought about it in 50 years. No, I'm not that old. But yeah, I mean, it is. I see this a lot. Um, I think we I think it's hit people how much we lost. uh from even relatively simple early digital technologies like floppy disk, uh, early mm -hmm. tape drives. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, NASA blueprints being lost, uh, stuff like that. Um, and I think some people have thought the internet and the cloud was a way around that. But as a person who's worked in digital publishing for 20 years, uh, there's a whole lot of articles that I wrote that are available nowhere or they might technically be on the internet and maybe we should talk about this a little bit too but good luck fucking finding them because the indexes have made it so hard to find some of this stuff um i i have many times gone looking for things that i know exist somewhere and i've tried to find it through google but the google algorithm has changed so significantly that I can no longer even figure out how to ask it, how to find the specific thing from five to 10 years ago. So I get why there's a lot of anxiety about this because it actually is a real problem, mm -hmm. but this actually isn't about that problem. Correct. Um, yeah. How does copyright complicate that the archival material? What, how does that interact? That's something I actually am just thinking about right now and haven't thought a whole lot about. Like, what, what does copyright limit us from doing and saving these kinds of archival materials? I mean, so um, I actually encourage everyone to go read United States copyright law because it's um, kind of fun and not that long. And a lot of the um, articles of copyright law, United States copyright law at least, are actually about the various ways that you or institutions can actually get around copyright law, right? Or not get around copyright law, but like um, sort of um, get around or not get around is not the right word, but like where the, you don't, um, the copyright isn't in play anymore. And section um, 108, yes, uh, 108 of copyright law is all about libraries and other cultural institutions. Um, getting to do that, the various ways that libraries and archives and museums, et cetera, get to sort of break the the copyright of a creator. And a lot of that has to do with preservation. Um, so for example, um, as soon as they stopped making VCRs, um, it became legal for libraries to make uh, not just like preservation copies of and VHS tapes um, on like DVDs, for example, but to circulate those instead of the VHS tapes because it is no longer kind of possible to buy or play um, those VHS tapes. And so those kinds of preservation copies are made all the time, especially in academic libraries, for example. Um, Justin probably knows way more about this though than I do. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the main interaction is that the maxim in preservation is lots of copies keep stuff safe. 
Mm -hmm. And so the more copies you can make, the more chance of preservation there is. And of course, copyright limits how we make copies. So there's a there's a very direct way in which copyright stops preservation and that it stops copying. Uh, so yes, there will be organizations like libraries who are allowed to copy, but it would be a lot better if the general public was just allowed to copy things and make their yeah. own archives and hordes as well, uh, simply because... You know, we know that a lot of stuff gets preserved through piracy because that's illicit copying, but the copies keep stuff safe. So it's kind of the same problem with um, digital publishing as well. Um, there's always been this emphasis on the copy of record, for example, which is a mixture of this is like the final prestige version that's in the journal that it's published in. But. And it's also the one where the metrics get pulled from in the digital age. Uh, but I think a lot of it goes back to like the print fetishization that, that exists in a lot of academic journals. But now, because there are so many preprint servers and institutional repositories, an academic article might have three or four copies somewhere. And so if there's a small open access journal that ends up publishing your paper, it might disappear from that open access journal, but hopefully there will be other copies on institutional repositories or preprint archives so that those aren't gone. Um, and, and for example, as a, as a policy at my university, if we find something that's published open archive, uh, open access under a, like a creative commons license, we'll just go ahead and put it in the repository, even though it's already open access out there, because what if something happens to the journal? So we, we just make mm -hmm. preservation copies and we can circulate those because they're openly licensed. So the more things that are in open licenses, the more preservation copies you can make. And so copyright just prohibits uh, mm -hmm. copying, and that's what that's a direct impact on on preservation. Yeah, and uh, Justin mentioned privacy as like to how a lot of um, I'm especially like you know a lot of movies I love that have come out recently don't get digital releases. Or, or don't get physical releases. They are just digital. Like um, this great horror movie, The Empty Man, only available mm -hmm. online. You cannot buy a physical copy of The Empty Man as much as I would buy 10 of them, right? Um, and I, I think libraries, because we are institutions that can sort of make these kinds of copies preservation-wise that people can't, other people can't without it being illegal, right? Um, uh, are going to have to get more comfortable with interacting with, piracy um because a lot of these uh digital only copies are behind paywalls that libraries also don't have access to right um and so how else do you get that besides like finding a torrent of it somewhere um like there's a story i tell all the time of, i was actually at a utah library association conference uh back a uh, couple back in the day and a uh, an academic library talked about how um, this one, you know, of course requested like this one movie or something. And the movie was, you could not buy a physical copy of it. It was like, they could not find any to buy anywhere. And they also couldn't find any online copies legally. However, they were able to find a digital pirated copy of it. And so what that library did is they went, this is the only copy we can find of this. And so we are going to get this pirate. We are going to do a piracy, right? We are going to do something illegal and get the pirated copy and put it on a very secure server. So it's just so that it's one preserved, but also it's available to this only the students in this class, right? Um, and I love that story. And I feel like more libraries, public, academic, whatever, are going to have to get more comfortable interacting with the sort of like system of piracy online just in order to get some of these copies in order to do preservation and access. Well, yeah, I think that's going to be really important as we've seen streaming material that has no physical mm -hmm. uh, media overlay just disappear for tax write-off yep. purposes. Yep. Um, and it, feel, it feels like, you know, dealing with film in the 30s when they would just randomly catch on fire. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, that's what it feels like. It's like we're, this is going to be a time period where, we're like, well, 
we have like maybe one fifth of all that was available between 2015 and whenever we figure out how to handle this, uh, because so much of it was just behind payrolls and lost. And we don't even necessarily know when it was released. Um, uh, I find that, you know, fascinating as, as a person who, um, arguably one of the most famous articles I've ever published is only available in pirated versions or uh, where the rights were actually not clearly established. Um, uh, I can tell you that I, I, I tend to not care when this happens and I've gotten to archiving all my own stuff because uh, as a podcaster, I've had podcasts go down or even uh, YouTube channels get bought and stuff just gets suppressed and lost and uh and the whole buying it's so like who actually owns youtube channels is an interesting and somewhat unsettled legal dispute in a lot of ways i mean youtube obviously owns it but like who owns the content on it can actually be interestingly debatable as i discovered two years ago so I, I do find all these things quite fascinating, but I also find it interesting in the sense that we're often dealing with international copyright law, as I've been behold, I have unfortunately been beholden to British copyright and libel laws before, and mm. having never stepped foot once in the country, um, and, and that is a interesting place to be right now. It does seem like we do not we're not living in a time where states seem like they're going to get on board with each other either to like settle these accords or differences in law um does that complicate anything in your work and how again we can tie this back to the internet archive um has the internet archive issue mm -hmm. been different handled differently in other countries mm -hmm. well copyright is more or less unified by like the burn convention so mm -hmm. that it's kind of standardized everywhere um canada was just forced in fact to extend their copyright law because they were a holdout so they had uh their copyright was life of the author plus 50 years everyone else was doing uh plus 70 years and they during a you know these things get usually hammered out during trade deals so during negotiations of a trade deal, they were within the last couple of years forced to fall into line. So um, copyright is pretty internationally solid. The the, the main differences uh, tend to be how much is a country going to enforce it on its own nationals if it's an international thing. So for example, uh, like uh, I was just reading this book from like 2009 and there was this, this massive piracy ring of like the entire production line of electronics in China. And basically what had happened was these Japanese companies would uh, would do all the legal work with a factory in China, which was actually operating as a front. They would have all of the licensing, all of the schematics, all of the legal agreements. And then they would take that and then they would, that factory, which was a front, would then license it to all of these other factories who thought they were dealing with the legitimate original party and so it created this massive uh amount of um independent so basically it was like a whole pirate shadow company with the same name branding everything but none of that stuff was from the original person and china the the, the question was is china going to uh go after a merchant who believes they were acting in good faith because it was a very convincing duplicate no, probably not. So there, like that difference matters, but the law in itself is pretty standardized. Where I got caught up it was different disagreements between states on who owns what. Um, so that was that was a fun, uh, a yeah. fun time period. Um, and again, that actually yeah. was an issue of nationals versus non-nationals, but. Mm. Um, and I remember one of the Internet Archive's arguments um, was that, like, because they are in the United States, um, they are in California, I, I believe, um, that, like, anybody who is a citizen and pays taxes in the United States, 
because the Internet Archive is a library, like it's sort of like how in order to get a library card at your public library, like, yes, it's free, but you're paying for it with your your taxes. Right. And so that that was another one of their arguments was sort of like, well, we aren't like it's limited to like the, the citizens of the United States or something, which I don't think is true. But um, I remember they did make that argument at one point. They were trying to do the like citizen thing. Yeah, and that does create geofencing things, which is that's the thing that's constantly brought up in open scholarship, which is okay because the taxpayer argument is there too. You know, most academic writing is done by public employees. Um, so why should citizens not be able to access it? So then if they come to this big agreement, like, okay, the citizens will have access, but it will be IP restricted. And so that's geofencing. And that's, you know, a whole other problem in terms of equity, the, the universality of science, the, the actual, you know, the actual principles of open scholarship, you know, principles don't usually get you very far in these kinds of arguments, but it's like, this was the whole point was to make science more open. Uh, and, you know, people get so caught up in the technicalities of like, what is, what is doable within the system that they forget that they had an original goal they were going after. And that's kind of one of the most frustrating things about it. Mm. So how much should we be worried about the, the internet becoming more and more nationally limited? Um, this, this has been on my mind a lot, completely separately. I wasn't thinking about it for a question today, but um, we've seen bills that have tried in the United States that have tried to do that. We, you know, I can tell you that as a person who's lived in several continents uh, that Internet access is radically sometimes very different between those continents, but it is still mostly I could get to things I needed to if I knew how to do it, usually legally. So not always, but usually. Um, how much is that changing, though? And and should we be worried about it? And in, in it like as a real threat, as opposed to this made up threat that seems to be about the Internet Archive? <laughs> I mean, I think it's already happening. Um and sex workers have been warning us about this um, because it's starting with FOSTA, SESTA, and also um, oh, whatever the child protection thing uh, about um, SEPA. SEPA, yeah, keep, got to keep kids safe online. And so we have to make sure all the porn websites get age verification, which requires ID verification, right? Which, um, like, yeah, sex workers have been warning us about this um, for years. Um, and it is um, a, an extremely conservative, anti-sex, anti-sex worker, um, homophobic, transphobic um, sort of um, goal and system. And yet it's be also being championed um, legally by a lot of Democrats um, because we've got, we've got to think of the children, right? Um, and... I don't think it actually passed this time, but this is something that like, I mean, you're in Utah, like, right. you, you know, and I, I know at one point, like the, um, they were going to try in Utah to like, where iPhones had to have like specific age restriction stuff on them, like, or else they couldn't be sold in Utah or used in Utah or something. And they I don't also think that tried to, yeah, they did pass, but it seems they have thrown out in court, uh, a, an age restriction on any use of social media. The, yeah. uh, beyond what the uh, consumer agreement was, but that, uh, you know, there's a limit to which tech lords you can piss off as a state like Utah uh, yeah. and the courts not. And, and honestly, it was one of those situations where I'm like, I don't know that I like either side of this lawsuit, but um, nonetheless. Uh, but yes, I live in Utah. I have a different internet, which is not that hard to get around, but still yeah. it's, it's 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 kind of obnoxious uh and it's also not well enforced this is one of the ironies of all this mm -hmm. uh is the enforcement is basically by lawsuit on the companies so there are some sketchy ass websites that just ignore it um and yeah. are probably way more extreme um 
but for whatever reason, Utah can't find them or they can't figure out who owns them to drag them to court, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, the, I don't know if they're going to try to put that on the distributors. But again, Utah going up against, I don't know, California business industry, uh, uh, they'll lose. But I do, I, I do see that this is already happening and it seems to be getting more and more severe. Another example is the entire... Uh, the entirety of the Brazil just lost yeah. access to X, even, you know, as much as I don't love X and I would love to take the side of the Brazilian courts against Elon Musk, it seems like a dangerous precedent to set. Um, yeah. So, yeah. There's, I also want to mention SEPA is an older bill for child online. The new one is COSA, um, Kids Go Online that. Safety Act. Is. And that one is much, much worse than SEPA. SEPA is like if you are a school or a library, you have to have these filters on. You don't have to have them on all the computers, but usually they do. Um, COSA is much more like the large websites, internet applications, search engines, uh, including social network sites, have to use algorithms that prioritize information furnished to the user based on user specific data. Um, I think, you know, like I'm in Texas, for example, like I can't access Pornhub unless I go through a VPN um, simply because they want to put in this um, ID verification system that, you know, you have to plug your ID into some sort of digital uh, verification system, which most you know, websites aren't able to comply with anyway, and or they probably would have to pay money to integrate that service into their website so that it eats into their operating costs. So there's, you know, I think you can see this with like piracy as well. There's a lot of ISP, um, like, an, like an ISP or, um, or a domain hosting service can be put on like a piracy watch list in like the EU, for example. So that way they can just keep stealing, you know, um, domains from pirate websites. They just keep them on a list. And whenever they see something like they just get uh, seized by the government. So, yeah, I think we are seeing, I mean, it's, it's definitely a real, I, I don't know how much of this is going to be on like national lines. I think it might definitely be along trade lines. EU definitely will act as one. Um, United States and Canada and Mexico will probably act as one um, because a lot of these will co go through trade deals, I think. But yeah, it's interesting in the United States because we have all these state governments which are going to do their own, you know, um, they have their own capacity to limit how the internet functions within their borders. And I mean, that's a recipe for all kinds of problems. But I, I think the idea of an open internet is kind of one that governments aren't interested in and anymore and they never really were but uh, i think you know the libertarianism of the tech sector is going away and it's it's moving rightward um which is the typical liber you know libertarian trajectory uh, it's it's that old uh uh youtube playlist of like two years ago i'm a libertarian uh what about the JQ? I am a fascist like two weeks ago, like that whole uh, progression of people down, down that, that rabbit hole. So it's not surprising that we th see people like Elon Musk and whatever um, jumping up and down on stage at a, at a Trump show or whatever. Um, it's, it's not surprising. So. Uh, yeah. From a political yeah, economic we, standpoint, but, go ahead. No, I think we, we should, be planning ahead of how we're going to maintain lines of communication internationally and how we're going to, because legislatively, I don't know how well we're going to fight back because in the United States, both parties are pretty on, on, on board with this. Um, so it's going to have to be popular actions of how are we going to get around these things? How are we going to plan for them and, and subvert them um, in our personal and our professional lives? Yeah, well, what I was going to say, political, economically, it makes sense to me that we see these tech giants doing this because they've got, they've had their free internet. Now they want to commodify it. And they've had their government handouts that got them able to establish monopoly power in almost all cases. 
Um, and now they don't need them anymore. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it makes total sense to me that it, even if it wasn't cynical, why they would start moving from libertarian or even maybe so uh, a Democrat, uh, Democrat uh, adjacent to whatever the fuck they are now. Um, and mostly that's going to be right wing. Even the liberal ones are more right wing than they used to be. I think about Jeff Bezos and what he's done to the Washington Post. Um, but I also think that, that you, you're right. There's not like, for example, the bipartisan consensus on TikTok has been sort of astounding to me because <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I mean, look, I think TikTok's annoying and probably bad for your kids, but like uh, the censorship gambit that you're doing here is clearly just U.S. media uh, organ protectionism. Um, and a kind of one that's going to have a lot of backfiring tied into it as well. Um, but it is interesting how much the nature of the internet has changed. And I wanted to ask you, you know, we talked about this among national lines. We talked about this with state lines. State lines are getting weird. It's just very hard to know what you can access at any, like Utah's internet versus Texas's internet versus New York's internet versus California's internet. It's going to be quite interesting if things continue the way they're going. Um, it's also interesting in that some of these states also aren't big enough to really enforce these laws. So it's going to be interesting how they get held up in courts. And a lot of them haven't really been tested yet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but given the current court system, I, I wouldn't be putting a whole lot of faith that it's going to go super progressively by the time they have to reconcile different, different courts rulings with the Supreme court. I'll just put it that way. Um, but the Internet Archive question is interesting to me because it is a story where uh, I want to be on this side of this group, but they've done it so sloppily that I can't be. And it actually might have it is both it has less repercussions than people are pretending that it has, but might have. Could it have long term repercussions though, and just minor shift to case law? What do you What do you guys see about that? That's probably what's gonna happen. It's just gonna like libraries already don't own our digital materials, our electronic like our electronic resources. We already don't own them, um, and I think one thing this case gets tied to a lot is um, the library futures um, like group where they are doing a lot around like lobbying for, for example, state like contract laws or whatever around um, how publishers sell eBooks to libraries. Right. Um, it's like, it's a lot of the same group of, of people. Um, and so that gets tied to this case a lot because that was sort of what the point of what the inner archive was doing was like kind of getting to own something digitally and do a you know do stuff with it um as opposed to licensing it because that was another argument like well you didn't but license that properly right like that was you know therefore the author is not getting money or whatever um that was one of the big things was like how did the internet archive get these materials they didn't license them they didn't license them that's the refrain um so i yeah i think this might sort of like I, I like to say that libraries are a lot of liberal bootlickers um who are obsessed with being good and following rules um and doing a good job and also we don't have money um so <laughs> we um there might be we, material incentive to being a liberal bootlicker because you don't have money <laughs> right, right. Like we can't afford to put a lot of these systems into place or to more accurately those who have power in libraries. So directors, deans or universities or whomstever, um, those people, they might have the money, but they don't want to put it towards labor. They don't want to have to hire people who come with benefits and health and you know all this stuff. They would rather outsource that to a third party like all of these like ebook licensors or whatever overdrive who blah whatever and just have them deal with it so instead of us having mass digitization and servers and all of that we make somebody else do that and then we don't pay our workers right um i think that's it's just more going to reinforce 
this sort of pattern of libraries um, don't get to own the things that we loan out electronically and that will, and then probably it will be legally harder to get out of that cycle. Mm. That brings up an interesting thing about labor and all this, because, you know, I'm a Marxist podcast. I talk a lot about labor, but I have often wondered why in many of these cases, I, I, I'm high enough in a school system that will remain unnamed so I can keep my job, uh, that, that I know how much we, we parcel out now to third party things and how expensive it is. It, it yes. is more than just hiring people, even with benefits cost. And you can no longer say it's a one-time expense. And it yes. has baffled me why administrators, even at the secondary and primary level, are heading in that direction, but they clearly are. Um, why do we think that is the way it is? Is it, is it labor control? Is it I mean, admittedly, in my field, there is a profound lack of staff anyway. But um, it, it, what do you think is leading to that calculation? Because sometimes it isn't even monetarily rational. So there must be some other rationality undergirding it. It's interesting. Uh, something that was mentioned on Trash Future recently was the de-skilling of the government because they no longer have people who are public employees who know how to run a train system. And so because no one even knows how it works, it seems like magic to them. And so they externalize it and they privatize it more, even though it makes no sense to do so. And I think to an extent we could apply that analysis to uh, universities who have spent so much time outsourcing certain things that you know, how could we hire someone to do this? Uh, because no one on staff knows how it works. Uh, and because you haven't developed your staff, right? We've been trying to make staff more precarious. We've been trying to get rid of the high wage. It's the Boeing problem. We got rid of all of these really expensive workers who we could hire other people at a third the cost um, and make more money because labor is almost always the biggest expense, whether it's public sector, private sector. So, yeah, I think part of it is the destruction of internal expertise um, is part of it. I think the other part is budget fights. It's some, for some reason, it's just easier to say, we'll spend $50,000 a year on this product instead of hiring one other person to help run this. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why that is, but I think it's just that staff are seen as more of a liability than a product. Um, I, and I think that's, I think that's a budget bureaucracy problem, but I think that, mm -hmm. I think the loss of expertise is an interesting angle to keep in mind. Um, I will also say the internet archive is one of these third parties that we outsource stuff mm -hmm. to, um, uh, libraries who cannot digitize their own things can send their stuff off to the internet archive to have them digitize it for them, as well as to host those scans in perpetuity on the internet archive servers um, so that those libraries don't have to have not just the staff, but also the equipment to do digitization, as well as the server space and the web space to host good quality scans of digital and of, of, of books and stuff. And like, you know, music libraries often won't send their stuff to the internet archive because the scans just aren't good enough quality. Um, but like a lot of libraries send their stuff off to the internet archive just for digitization, um, even if it's not hosted publicly. Um, so like the internet archive is one of these third parties that libraries send stuff off to because we won't develop our own in-house systems for you know, not having the money or they refuse to give us the money or the space or the tools, that kind of thing. Yeah. And it's interesting, particularly with like the issue of scanners, you would think libraries would figure out some kind of system to just loan each other this, the, these machines, because a lot of it comes down to no one wants to put the capital investment in a big scanner. Um, so it really makes me wonder why, why aren't we just collectively purchasing these things and loaning them out? Um, you know, if, especially if you were like a community college consortium, 
where you know no one is going to buy this stuff on their own. Uh, community colleges, by the way, are always coming up with the best ideas for stuff, and people don't give them any credit um, because they have to work with a lot less, and they come up with they they work closer together than even my own university system does. Uh, the universities in my system don't talk to each other that much, but community colleges, they'll just you know make these huge consortiums and and share information. So uh, if you want to know solutions like some sensible solutions to stuff, you usually look there. But yeah, um, the the investment in in machines as well as a problem, and so yeah, like yeah, it's more than just the labor. Yeah, like at my previous job, I was a solo librarian, and so I had to do all of the like library and day to day stuff as well as all about the administrative stuff around like budgeting and dealing. And you know, I was just I was at a music library, and we just had like a basic sort of big book scanner so that people could make copies of scores and stuff when they needed to. Um, and the uh, just to have that scanner continue to work, um, even though it was really old and out of warranty, we had to pay like, I think it was something like, I don't know, $2,500 every single month. Um, just so that scanner worked. Like we couldn't just like not have a subscription to it like we that it was like an, uh, a continuing cost just to have like the software attached to the scanner work mm. um so like yeah the the companies that make the uh, the tools as well are kind of getting in on the like the rentier uh economy uh well even if you want this big nice scanner you're gonna have to fork over like you know thirty thousand dollars a year for it yeah, the uh, the servicing agreements or support agreements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I'll become a vulgar Marxist for a second and be like, of course they want to do that because it's um, because real commodities have to compete with each other in the market and that tends to drive profits down, whereas rents don't they're naturally monopolies you can't do a damn thing about them they're enforced by the government and it's a guaranteed revenue stream um and it's i, I have noticed for in the past decade more and more things are going through that model um i don't think it's ultimately sustainable but i also have the same th fear that you guys have about like de-skilling. I've thought about de-skilling for three years. Uh, during COVID, I realized how much, how much uh, expertise was in administration. And for people, most people know about the administrative blow at universities, but what they don't know is that's also all the way down. Um, and that the, the in, in, increasingly large portions of the cost of educating even students in public school goes directly to administrative salaries and we're trying to cut everything else and sometimes i think part of that is about the fact that it's not even about money rationality it's about power rationality that large groups of of interest within the labor force will tell you no occasionally and these these uh subcontractors won't but these subcontractors um, often aren't even complying with the law. This is this is a, a weird rant, but uh, like I know, for example, that most charter charter schools use financial subcontractors, which do not comply with federal law. So when they get in trouble, they almost always get shut down, and it's actually kind of part of the problem of who they're having run their books because they don't do it themselves. They don't feel like they have the expertise. Um, and this is ubiquitous in our society, and I think the stuff on the internet is making it more obvious how ubiquitous it is, but. It's also super expensive to have an infinitely complex number of middlemen do everything for you. Like, um, with an infinite number of systems, one of the things that we see in our education is they're constantly getting contracts with, with these companies, and then the contract will last two or three years. We'll make all kinds of stuff, lessons or whatever, for students in these systems, and then they'll just go away, often without telling us what to do and we're scrambling for it. Um, and I suspect that that's actually a bigger problem than at libraries, because at least we can kind of go old school if we have to, but um, some of these library systems really can't. They're not, they, they don't have uh, physical copies of this media, or they don't exist at all. Like it's, 
it's a very interesting problem. Um, uh, I, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, this is kind of covered it uh, to, to some degree. I think we've talked about some interesting stuff. I would tell people to listen to your show because I actually do think these copyright laws and library stuff, there's the obvious stuff like Utah, Texas, and Florida passing weird rules about what we can even have in the classroom in ways that have knock-on effects that even the legislatures don't see till we have to deal with it. Um, my favorite one is letting infinite challenges go for us pulling books and expecting that we won't just pull everything eventually. Um, but there's a lot of other more subtle issues in, in this issue in this area that we should care about. And we are, I think it's finally guiding people to look at the encrapification of the internet. Like it's just a lot less useful than it was even five years ago. But, um, and I think also people like with YouTube, so many people dependent on, platforms that they don't have any control over whatsoever, even though their livelihood is directly tied into it. Um, and they can theoretically just go away. As I say on a podcast, it's going to go on YouTube. But nonetheless, um, I think your, your, your coverage of libraries can get people to think about a lot of these problems that are not always so obvious to the average person. And I want to thank you for that. So is there anything else you guys want to plug? Um, uh, no, it's just librarypunk.gay is our website. We're on all the podcast apps. Um, we were just on, uh, pod damn America talking about this. Um, I, Jay has another podcast called tender subject about cannibalism and m media. Um, we're in, and I go on there sometimes to talk about, uh, Christianity and, and origin myths and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, am I forgetting anything? We have a Discord, uh, so you can go yeah. and join. Um, yeah, and I would say, like, uh, some of our more relevant episodes, um, we've done a couple uh, on the Internet Archive case, um, including with Kyle Courtney. Uh, he and I are, are friends, so I was like, hey, Kyle, come on. <laughs> Talk about this for, for us. Um, we've also done a couple or an episode or two about, like, the, um, the issue of, like, porn in libraries and book bands and like that kind of thing which might be relevant to folks um and a couple of the authors that we've had on to talk about it and um, have brought it up as well so we've had core doctoro on uh, especially talking about his book choke point capitalism which talks about a lot about licensing and copyright and how this affects a creator specifically um we had chuck tingle on uh and we we talked about book bands a little bit with him as well um and uh, david demchuk who actually gave a really interesting perspective on the internet archive case because one of his early books is out of print and he's worried for example that if it's like on the internet archive he won't be able to set the terms on which he republishes it if he ever wants to for example um so a lot the authors that we've had on have had really interesting uh perspectives on this issue as well mm. okay well definitely check out the podcast and thank you so much for coming on and talking about a bunch of issues, including ones that I didn't prep you that I was going to ask you about. So, uh, <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> uh, see you soon.